Welcome back, friends. Uh, this is Dan Chande of the People's Heart with another lecture from the Black History Month programming. Today, we are lucky to have uh, Lori Lobenstein on ideas, arrangements, effects, systems, thinking, and social justice. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping information as per always. The views expressed by the speakers and workshop facilitators do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the organizing groups. Similarly, all programming uses the Zoom meeting or webinar format. Uh, for the webinar format, we've traditionally turned off the chat function to prevent unexpected interruptions. Um, and questions were submitted to speakers using the question and answer function. But Lori and we decided that we're gonna run this session a little differently. So you'll find that your chat function is open and you can communicate with everyone else here. We just ask that you be respectful and don't put anything up that you wouldn't want your friends and family to see. All right, as always, we wanna thank the Black Project, that is the Black Literacy and Arts Collaborative. They're a Boston-based nonprofit aimed at creating resources for literacy and arts in communities of color. They have mentorship programs, a storytelling to build medical trust project, a spread the love program, which is this beautiful program, bringing in strangers to share messages of togetherness and strength, and book giveaways. You can learn more about them at theblackproject.org. Similarly, uh, some of this program was created with the People's Heart. They're a healthcare institution and community art placemaking collaboration. Their mission is to change institutional healthcare culture and empower underserved patients and communities of color through art and design. Their programming uh, includes art on walls, workshops, lectures like this, and pop-up health events. You can learn more about them at thepeoplesheart.org. Now, without further ado, I pass it over to Diaz Ghosh of the People's Heart, who will introduce Lori. Hi, Lori. Thanks so much for joining us here today at the People's Heart and to celebrate Black History Month and Black History Year, if you will. Um, Lori Lobenstein is a co-founder of Design Studio for Social Intervention. She grew up in a family and community um, of union organizers and community organizers and decided early on that working with youth was her passion and her route to creating change. She was a youth worker for 20 years in settings as diverse as classrooms, basketball courts, museums, and foreign countries. She now facilitates national work around diversity, equity, and design. Her most recent book in writing has been uh, was Social Justice Practice, exploring the role of artists in creating a more just and social, pub uh, and social public. Did I say that right? I don't know that I said that right. Um, <laughs> um, Lori has spent many years in Boston creating space in many different ways and areas. Um, and her current work has been in creating space in uh, Somerville, where I have met you and where we worked to where we got a chance to work together and get to know each other in the work that you were doing. Um, without me butchering anything else, Lori, why don't I let you take the take the stand and tell us uh, more about Design Studios and get us started with um, talking about systems and social thinking. Sure, absolutely. Thank you all so much for having me. I want to really particularly thank Dia, who it's been a pleasure to get to know, and People's Heart for having me for Black History Month and Black History Year. Um, also, the Black Project, which I got to know through you all. So uh, thanks so much. Um, I won't say a lot more about myself. The Design Studio for Social Intervention has been around for about 15 years uh, here in Boston. We work locally and nationally when we're lucky internationally. Um, our mission is to change how social justice is imagined, developed, and deployed. Um, so I'm going to share a um, slide deck uh, with our ideas, arrangements, effects framework and kind of walk you all through it, specifically um, in the context of health. And also uh, just be as interactive as possible. So there'll be some times when I turn to all of you and ask you for your own ideas coming from your knowledges and experiences in the field. Um, so let me share my screen. Make sure. All right, can y'all see that? Yes. Okay, beautiful, thank you. 
So the the premise is, uh, well, let me back up a second. There's the book. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago. It came out right at the beginning of COVID, which was really crazy. Um, but I can talk more about that later. The premise was really something that we uh, came to as we thought about our work over the first 10 or 12 years of the studio, realizing that as we think about social justice, we need to recognize how ideas are embedded within arrangements, which in turn produce effects. And we felt like this was uh, critical because so often um, myself being raised by organizers and Kenneth Bailey, the co-founder of the studio, also being a community organizer, realizing how often our work is consumed by challenging and taking on really negative effects of injustice. Um, and also as organizers, how good we are at tracing those effects back to the big ideas, understanding capitalism, racism, sexism, homophobia, um, nationalism. Um, but sometimes there's a, a, an overlooked terrain of social and physical arrangements. So we wanted to dig into that. And one of the simplest um, examples that we start with familiar to all of us is the arrangement of the classroom. And so you can see there on the left, right? There's that traditional arrangement of chairs and rows, the teacher in the front, um, the students with their backs to each other, because um, the teacher has knowledge, right? There's ideas embedded in that arrangement. Um, the teacher has knowledge that they need to share. And that's often true. Um, we see a different arrangement on the right. This is an arrangement often used um, in pop popular education, um, in the workshops that we do with young people. Um, and the chairs have been rearranged and they've been arranged into a circle where everyone can see each other. And you can see the, the idea embedded in that arrangement is that we all have knowledge to share. Um, and so just to get people rolling a little bit in the chat, um, I'm wondering what other ideas are embedded in this in these arrangements of chairs and what effects these different arrangements might have. So uh, asking all of you, our hosts from People's Heart and our guests, if folks wanna add some things in the chat, what are some of the ideas embedded in this arrangement and what are some effects it might be producing? And you're also welcome to just talk. You can uh, shout it out. <clears throat> Maybe not, this is a webinar. That might not be possible. Um, <laughs> add that to the chat, I'm lying, I'm lying. Um, this, uh, all of these Zoom arrangements, right, are hard to keep track of. So, well, uh, these are also arrangements, right, in some way, shape or form. It's kind of funny that we are talking about arrangements. Totally, totally. <laughs> um, people's heart to everyone, experts in the front versus community discussing as equals. Absolutely. I kind of agree with that. I remember as a child when we had to be sitting right in front if you couldn't see the board um, mm. back in the days of blackboards and chalk. Mm -hmm. I'm totally dating myself here, but. That is, the, that chalkboard is another arrangement, right? And who sits in the front and who sits in the back in that traditional arrangement? Um, Alianora said um, it provides a more open space to share ideas, right? So we have an effect of that, of those chairs in a circle, right? Where we're sitting together and seeing each other and sharing ideas. Absolutely. All right, I'll keep it going. Um, and we have a lot more chances to share ideas. Oops, I think I can keep it going. Oh. Here we go. Um, thinking about effects, um, we think about effects in two different ways. The big things that we're fighting against, the sort of largest pieces of injustice, right, that we show up at that protest because of the effects of state-sanctioned violence against the Black community, or the unequal effects of, of COVID on our communities, or the effects of gentrification. Um, but effects are also the little things that we experience every, every day, the accumulation of overlapping arrangements. And you can think about even getting to that protest, right? We, people are experiencing different effects. Someone else, someone's leaving for their job. Someone's, their back is hurting. Someone's being profiled by the cops. Someone doesn't know how they're getting home. Someone, you know, might have gotten there in a very different way based on the accumulating effects of racism, right? Like if me as a white woman, I get to drive up in my car, right? 
I'm not being profiled. I might be at that same protest, right? But I'm not taking the same risks. I'm not having the same experiences and I'm not having the same effects. So when we think about effects, we're really thinking about those big and small effects. And when we trace them back to ideas, all the way back to ideas, we think about the big ideas and then the small and tricky ideas. Um, big ideas remain sturdy oftentimes because they hide in these small and tricky ideas. So when we think about racism, we know how to call out really obvious racism, but it can be whitewashed, um, right? These, these big sturdy ideas, racism, classism, sexism, um, that are creating and keeping inequality sturdy in our country, right? So, so here's some examples of how they combine to produce higher coronavirus infection and mortality rates in black and brown people in America, right? Really thinking about literally who are our frontline workers? Who are, you know, when you, when you look at in industries that are on the backs of black and brown women, you see how racism, classism, and sexism are putting those workers more at risk for the coronavirus. Um, and in the meantime, the small and tricky ideas, right? That kind of keep racism sturdy in everyday life. When we think about these words like trusted or welcoming or safe, who do we consider safe? What do we consider a welcoming environment? Who do we consider a hardworking employee? What's, um, a, who, does a, who gets that well-deserved raise? Who's considered good? We can really find ways to, you think about our hospitals um, and who we value in our hospitals. When you look at the need for interpretation, right? Or translation. Um, how did we get there? We got there by a long system of valuing a set of skills that come more easily and more readily to a privileged white community, right? So even as we fight for interpretation and translation in our hospitals, we need to look around and say, why do we have so many staff that only speak English? And why don't we see that as a problem? Why do we need a whole nother set of folks who speak Haitian Creole and Spanish and Mandarin, and why isn't that a part of our regular staff, right? So some of these ideas can be really obvious, but some of them can be really tricky in terms of how do we look at that resume? Who are we valuing? Who are we offering that position to? What does it take to get into that hospital? And why are we privileging folks from that even medical school, right? So um, yes, Dia. If you don't want me walk uh, stepping in, I was actually, yeah. I, keep, I keep thinking about the first slide that you put up and, you know, that when we were talking about space and being lined up like that, mm. everything that you're talking about, we don't actually need to look at each other to even be able to see. But when we're sitting in that circle, all of a sudden we're able to see each other um, mm -hmm. differently mm -hmm. uh, and uh, acknowledge each other differently. And so what are we... What are, what are we acknowledging? What are we avoiding? I guess those are the questions that are running through my mind as you yeah. keep through your slides. So let's come back to those questions. I love those questions. What are we acknowledging and what are we avoiding? Let's think about those when we come back to a Q&A at the end. Um, what are we seeing and what are we not seeing, even when we do sit facing each other? Um, one of the uh, small and tricky ideas that, you know, came to me as we were starting to, to think about COVID, right, was people would say, oh, well, COVID doesn't discriminate. And then we would hear like, all you got to do is just socially distance, just wear your mask right, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do you socially distance when you're sharing an apartment with 12 people? And what does it mean to socially distance when you're a frontline worker and you're trying to take care of your child, right? So, so this idea that COVID didn't discriminate was so quickly, like, absurd, right, in terms of this notion and this really American notion of the individual. If we just individually do this right, we'll be safe. And if you're sick, it must be your fault, right? So who do we see and not see? Um, but I would love to hear from folks, what's a, a big idea or a small and tricky idea uh, that impacts an issue that you're fighting? If any come to mind, just add them to the chat. I mean, I can tell you a little bit about my experience through COVID, uh, where I spent a little bit of time in India and had to really look at space um, differently, mm. where there were, you know, the, the distance was also less. It was three feet, not six feet, because you couldn't have three feet distance um, between people. 
And when you're talking about, you know, space in terms of sharing space, yeah, 14, yeah. 15 people living together in small spaces um, and having to go out to work and then being tested and not having the means to be tested because it cost in, in, in India, it actually cost money to be tested. Mm. And it was, in my experience, it was um, the frontline workers, so the daily wage earners, whether they mm -hmm. had been in construction or home care um, and family care, they were the ones who were coming to the buildings and had to be tested on a regular basis. But people who were of privilege going into offices weren't expected to be tested in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the outbreaks were actually in creative fields um, because they were, yeah, they were still meeting. Yeah, Even interesting. So they were tested and they had to be in this bubble and, um, but even still, they were yeah. the ones who were moving it. Yeah, and I think about folks on the front lines, even when they did test positive, you know, the idea was that they would then somehow be able to isolate, you know, and, and that really requires a certain sort of home to say, oh, I'm gonna be sick and I'm gonna isolate a certain sort of resources and even relationships. Um, are there kids that are dependent on you? Are there elders dependent on you? Do you even have a room to isolate? You have your own bathroom? like. This is really a notion of a home that's based in, you know, a lot of privilege, uh, primarily in middle class white America. Absolutely. Not necessarily <laughs> based on a whole lot of homes and apartments either here or in India. Absolutely not. And then we talk about disinfectants and, you know, spraying ourselves down and using all of the products that we're using on mm. our skins and, and health concerns that come from, from just that. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't even started to think about any of that, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to dig a little bit into arrangements, this rich terrain that we have for intervening and reimagining. And why did we use this word arrangement? Um, when we talk about arrangements, we're really thinking about both the, the hard arrangements of physical arrangements. Um, in this case, right, we could see our original drawing with some extra a little more setting thrown in. So the hard physical arrangements of chairs, desks, um, the flag, uh, the door, the schedule, uh, that blackboard, um, but also the soft or social arrangements, the social arrangements of, um, you can see a kid in the front row raising uh, their hand. That's, that's the social arrangement, raising that hand. And, and maybe they're called, maybe they have an answer and they wanna get called on, or maybe they wanna go to the bathroom which gives us another strange social arrangement, right? We have these bathroom passes, that's a social arrangement. They have gender, that's a social arrangement, right? So there's a lot going on here in terms of social arrangements. Some of the examples I, I've put here on the left are a little more related to, to COVID and to uh, what's going on with, with healthcare and our larger kind of social determinants of health, right? Health insurance, ICE, police, languages are social arrangements, right? Hiring practices, protests and elections. Um, so really thinking about uh, the, the arrangements as both hard and soft arrangements. And it would be fun if folks want to add um, either some of those arrangements from the classroom, right? Or some of the arrangements that are impacting an issue that you're working on um, at MGH or elsewhere. You were talking about this, uh, Lori. You were talking about how um, who we who who teaches us, like the teachers mm -hmm. uh, we have in our classroom, mm -hmm. um, and I bet that that's different in every every community uh, and how that's selected. It is and it isn't. I mean, it's a great question. We have overwhelmingly in the United States. Uh, a teaching core of white women, particularly at the elementary level. And more of our teachers at the high school level are men, but we still have a predominantly white teaching core. This is something when I work with educators, particularly educators of color, they talk about this loss when we integrated our schools. And that integration wasn't about students going to um, 
different mixing it up in different segregated schools. It was about closing the black schools and sending all of the black students to white schools because the white schools were the recognized and resource schools. The black families wanted better resources for their students, but not at the cost of having teachers that represented them, that reflected them, that came from their communities, that understood them. And so this is seen as a really a huge loss. Um, I was working with some uh, African-American teachers in North Carolina who just talked about that loss and that decimation of the teaching core of Black teachers um, when that happened. Um, so we do have, you know, a, a whole a variety of teachers, but overwhelmingly, we're also dealing with the arrangement of white women teachers in the front of the classroom in school districts like Boston that are predominantly students of color. And so really, that that is part of the challenge of the arrangement of education and the arrangement of um, the professionalization of education, right? And what it takes to get a teacher, teacher's license and who's doing that. And of course, COVID impacts that as well. Um, are teachers gonna stay in the field? It's such a hard time for educators as well as for students and their families. Well, yeah, when teachers had to start teaching from homes, um, mm -hmm. while taking care of their own families and having, you know, some had their own children mm -hmm. on, uh, That's right. you know, in school. That's right. And just That's managing right. that, yep. um, I can't imagine. It's huge. And it's I huge. think there's the, the overlapping arrangements we also have, and we're grateful to have unions in our public education system. Um, but unions often are structured so that the most recently hired teachers are the first ones to get laid off. And so we see even in, in districts that are trying to diversify their teaching staff, right? Oftentimes the newest hires are our teachers of color and they are the first to get laid off when there are budget cuts. Um, so another interesting and challenging arrangement as we try to diversify our teaching core, um, as we try to diversify our nursing core or our doctor core, or our, you know, like when we think about how these things happen and what are some of the challenges that we need to intervene in. Um, Mary in the chat adds hierarchies assumed and asserted dominance of patriarchal values, active and passive. Absolutely. Some groups valued as better, a false sense of security as institutions certainly impose their value over individuals. Um, thank you so much, Mary. Um, I would love to hear a little bit if you're talking about that from a hospital perspective or an education perspective. Um, that is really, really interesting and on point, right? This assumed and asserted dominance of patriarchal values. We can <laughs> see some of that in the classroom. We can see that in the map in the classroom. We can see that in who's in the front of the classroom. Oh, and re research in medical school, but largely across all society. Right, so absolutely, who's being valued and who's being taught, right? In terms of what kind of research is taught who's getting uh, into which medical schools, who's getting promoted and teaching at those medical schools. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna keep it moving here. Um, I wanna give us a chance to really map how ideas are embedded in arrangements and what effects they might be producing. Um, so here is Mass General Hospital. We have some overlapping arrangements. You can see we have an emergency room, right? So that is an arrangement that we are familiar with. We have a patient drop-off, right? And in that patient drop-off, you can see we have um, the security guard. Anyone who's tried to drop off a patient, we know, right? Like you have this moment of tension, right? You're, you hope you have a car. You hope you can get your loved one there. You know you're going to get shooed away. You can't wait. You're trying to figure out, like, is someone going to help them? I recently uh, had a a dear friend with knee surgery, he ended up in the ER. Is someone gonna help him even get into the ER? Cause I can't stay. Um, so some overlapping arrangements right from the jump. And then he's like, you know, in, you know, scale nine out of 10 pain. And he's like clutching his health insurance card, right? Cause he knows that he needs that. Um, so we have that social arrangement of health insurance. We have the ambulance, right? And the ambulance entrance and all of those emergency arrangements. Um, Let's uh, look at this, um, love to hear from y'all. This is another way that we do IE mapping, which is we map onto a text. Um, so I found this helpful text explaining to somebody in case they had time before they went to the ER to look up what their emergency care would be like. Um, let's take some time to look at some of the arrangements 
um, embedded here and what might be some <laughs> ideas embedded in this arrangement. So let's call out some of the arrangements here. I'm just noticing um, from our previous talk about uh, previous conversation about um, oh, thank education. You. Historically, teaching was uh, a male profession in the early 1900s that was well compensated, but as women joined the workforce, salaries and cost of living increases decreased. Thank you um, so much. Pranina, yeah. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. All right. So we see that kind of sexism. When a field is predominantly women, it is paid worse than when a field is predominantly men. Um, and then you can even trace, as Anastasia did, that as a field transitions, it gets to being worse paid. The same positions get to be worse paid. So love that sturdy sexism. All right. And that overlapping, right, of sexism and um, classism, right, and the impacts it has on communities and families that are led by women and women in the workforce. Well, right off the bat, I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, it's going to take us a long time to do this. So I better have the time mm. and I better not have to be at work today. So oh, we're, we're thinking about time um, and time as a social arrangement and who gets to have time. Um, we're here looking at emergency care. I can see some arrangements here of tests, right? Testing is, is a whole set of arrangements that comes, at, comes into play at the hospital. Um, waiting. And we're going to look a little later at, at, at the weight room of the ER, right? And that set of arrangements is something we might want to intervene in. Um, the uh, trying to keep you as comfortable as possible. Um, emergency room weight rooms are not comfortable at all. I mean, even when you're the able-bodied person bringing your friend in, right? There's not some great smell of someone cooking some great food. There's not some book of beautiful, encouraging images. Of, I don't know, what would I want to be comfortable? None of that's there. There's some horrible vending machine, right? Um, that might give me some, maybe some healthy options, right? And then the clincher, after we've made it through the weight room and they wanted to keep us for observation, but not for admission. We've probably been there for 24 hours at this point. Our emergency room staff is overworked and exhausted. Our emergency room patients are stressed and they're trying to be seen. And then have someone check with your health insurance company about whether that service is covered. That's an arrangement, right? That is an arrangement, goodness. That is stressful. Uh, and, and Raina adds, thinking about what any of this means, who to check with my insurance? Who's gonna check with my insurance? Are these tests explained in a way that I understand? Are they explained in a way that I understand even if I'm an English speaker? Because it's probably gonna be an English speaker that ex explains it to me. It might not. Even, it might be in some medical ease that I don't even get, and a whole bunch of numbers run off in, in front of me, right? When I don't necessarily know what those numbers are, or I might be speaking English as a second or third language, and someone's just speaking to me in English, 100 miles an hour because they're they got 12 more patients to see. Great questions, great points, Raina. Thank you so much. I mean, and as you think of that, even entering into the emergency space and when you're when you're being tested and when you're seeing a clinician, when you're in a room with a clinician, mm. you have like maybe 10 minutes, 15 10 minutes. minutes to come up with your questions, have them prepared, be able to ask them, understand the response and know what the next steps are. Yeah. Um, all in that time, again, you know, in speaking in English. Yeah. Um, you know what you make me think of, Dia, is, is preparing my dad to see a doctor, you know, and he's 78 now. And oh my gosh, does he write down his questions ahead of time? And he's so stressed and he talks so slowly, you know, trying to get his little list of questions in and really answered for him. That's all the time you have. You have 10 That's minutes. Yeah, yeah, which Raina says also makes me think about what it looks like to consent to medical procedures, but that may be a different conversation altogether, right? That idea of consent and what kind of time do you have to understand? How's it been explained to you? Huge point. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, um, I've been working a lot with um, a group in Providence called Sistafire, and they have been taking on Women and Infants Hospital, and that's one of the things they did 
uh, some participatory action research uh, with women who had experienced the you know, pregnancies and deliveries at Women Infants Hospital. And, and that consent uh, has been a big issue. The, tran the translation interpretation services, the emergency room services, but thank you for bringing consent into the conversation. Absolutely. Let's see, we have another arrangement here, um, the arrangement of prescriptions. Uh, and the arrangement of prescriptions has overlapping arrangements, right? Um, so let's think about what are some of the overlapping arrangements that come with prescriptions. Let's say you have to get your prescription. You have to take your prescription or have it sent to a pharmacy. That's an arrangement, right? Someone has to be able to go to that pharmacy and pick up your prescription, which may or may not be you, depending on how badly you're injured or how ill you are. Um, someone has to get it to your home. You have to remember to take it. You have to have safe drinking water to take it. You have to have a refill if you're still in pain. Again, I'm thinking about my friend with a knee surgery. Um, but what are some of the ideas embedded in this arrangement of prescriptions? Oh, there's the pills themselves. Let's not forget the actual <laughs> arrangement, right, of, of pills. The cost, insurance. Mm -hmm. There are ideas of expertise. There are ideas of that doctor knowing more about your body than you do, but also ideas of that doctor knowing about medicine and knowing for your illness, what would make you feel better? What would help you be safer? What would bring your blood pressure down or decrease the swelling in your knee, right? There's ideas of knowledge. There's ideas of the power of medicine. Um, there's ideas of control. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're seeing this really intense level of control, right? So my friend with the knee surgery had an opioid, you know, had a, a oxycodone prescription, right? So there's really intense control around that. And what does that mean when we also have um, issues of who do we trust and not trust? So my friend who was getting this in the hospital was then prescribed very, very little an African-American man prescribed very, very little as if he was not gonna safely be able to use it, as if he was gonna somehow, you know, start to sell it or overuse it. Um, Megan uh, also adds that biases about pill-seeking behaviors versus pain management. Who do we trust and not trust with those pills? Um, uh, my friend went from being on three pills like every four hours or every six hours to being, being given enough to basically drop down to one. You know, so the pain he was in was excruciating. Um, and Megan also uh, in line, I think in my next slide, I have, um, this was a, a workshop that I was doing. This was actually the Cystifier team as they were thinking about prescriptions. Um, they ended up, we were doing this, right? Mad Libs, if anyone remembers back to Mad Libs where you fill in things, not usually ideas, arrangements, effects, but um, for them, they were really looking at the idea that black women feel less pain was embedded in the arrangement of prescriptions. And what it produced for the women they were talking to was that they were being left in more pain. They were not being believed about their own bodies. They were being distrusted. And I think Megan, that's exactly what you were getting to. Who do we trust and not trust? And how does that actually make us create, you know, the opposite of healthcare, right? Uh, just more pain. When we're talking about expertise too, in, in terms of prescriptions, we are relying entirely on uh, on the pharmaceutical companies to give us the correct information, even to the doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right, yeah. And so are we getting the right information? Yeah. I wanna look at a really different arrangement. So thinking about the arrangement of doulas and um, what are some of the ideas embedded in this arrangement? Oh, and Megan adds, thank you, before we go on, the implicit biases that are being taught in medical education, right? And how that's being taught and underscored from our medical education, from being students to being interns in the hospital um, to what we hear from our peers. Back to the last slide. Let's see, I can go back to the last slide. Oh, that went, here we go. Thinking also about power dynamics between the provider 
and PT and the ability to advocate for yourself to a doctor. Folks not knowing how to, act, how to say, actually, that doesn't seem like it would help me or asking for different care. So that power dynamic that, of course, um, I want to just actually jump ahead for a second because um, this power dynamic is something that we think about when we talk about how we arrange ourselves and each other. And when our positions of power, when our arrangements that give us positions of power as the doctor, as the teacher, as the supervisor, as the service provider, right? It gives us more power. And as we think about when our work puts us in charge of people, puts us in charge of knowledge or resources, even pills, we slide into these fixed choreographies, right? And we have to realize that this is a familiar dance that we're doing. Even the dance, Thea, that you talked about, about that 10 minute appointment, right? Our dances have time limits. How is this choreography of interaction? What's it doing to us? What's it doing to each other? Um, what does it afford or deny as we're trying to provide quality health care? What is it keeping this arrangement, this choreography of who we see ourselves as versus who we see the patients as? I think that's a piece that people's heart is really thinking about, right? How do we create a community of health that involves both those receiving care and those giving care that doesn't have such a clear delineation, right? That says we're all trying to live healthy lives. Even us as healthcare providers, we need to be healthy. We also need to seek care, right? And our patients also have important knowledge, right? So how do we rearrange that arrangement of how we talk to each other in an appointment, in an emergency room, um, whatever the case may be, right? And so we think about as we are imagining a new world, right? And we're gonna get into this a little bit as we imagine new arrangements, right? How do we also need to rearrange our habits of thought, our habits of speech, the ways that we interact? I'm um, seeing we have uh, Megan thinking about how this also contributes to demoralization of healthcare workers stuck in a system that they can't necessarily control, right? They're not trying to meet with their patient for 10 minutes right? That doesn't give them a quality feeling. It doesn't even help them feel like they're really providing quality education. Thank you so much. Or like these burnt out folks in the ER, right? Just, I mean, this is a system that's clearly not working and they know that they're providing quality care. They know that they're doing their best, but there's so many elements that are dehumanizing for them and for the people that they're seeing. That's the key word that I was that I kept going back to dehumanizing. Mm. It's almost like, you know, the human part of us is 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 it's void, like the system um, is void of that. Mm -hmm. In trying to trying to address all of the moving parts, I guess. Mm -hmm. Let's think into a more humanizing arrangement, um, because I didn't want to think about healthcare as, as just the challenges of what's going on in our hospitals right now. Doulas are a part of our hospital systems. They're also a part of home births or birthing centers. What are some of the ideas embedded in this arrangement of doulas that feel so different and so much more perhaps expansive than um, you know, that prescription, say the arrangement of the doctor prescribing pills to us? I can't help it, but my mind goes to earthy crunchy. Is this is this legitimate? Is this you know? Are they are they able? Mm. And we see that like one of the things that came up during uh, COVID actually was that in some hospitals doulas were no longer allowed in with their patients. So it was somehow that their service was not critical. That their service and their relationship that they had built with their with the patient was not as important as the relationship that the hospital had. So questioning, again, going back to one of our um, participants, questioning their knowledge because they're women. Questioning their knowledge because they're women of color or they're elder women, right? Questioning this entire kind of knowledge because it's a knowledge that comes out of women's knowledge of their bodies and the knowledge of the elders. So sometimes when we're thinking about new arrangements, we're actually reaching back to some old arrangements, right? Or some arrangements that don't come from Western medicine. Um, and this idea that actually knowing this patient in a different way and being able to think about their body in a more holistic way might really produce different effects um, for the mother, for the father, right? For the baby, for the family, maybe for a sibling that's also been a, a part of this care. Um, I want to give us a little time to imagine new arrangements. Um, you all are 
really swimming in some arrangements that you have a deep critique of. And so we can think about intervening in existing arrangements and also imagining new ones. And at the studio, we think about this imagining new ones as sort of the skills of like the early hip hop DJs, right? Where they took, actually turned the turntables into instruments, right? They took that arrangement and they re rearranged music um, or cooks that are doing like phenomenal fusion cooking. But when you think about that, way that it's participatory, right? You're not just cooking and then the food is there, like you're eating it, you're eating it with people, you're DJing and you're watching what gets people on the dance floor, how they're flowing, how that's bringing up new moves, new ideas, new sounds, new tastes, new smells. So that kind of collaboration and imagination. I want to share a couple examples from DS4SI and then we can think about um, what this might look like from a more specifically uh, healthcare perspective. Um, Jessica adds, I, I really wanted to come and I'm so glad I'm here. I think a lot about the role of ableism in all of this. Thank you. And how things would shift if we assume that all bodies are good and all bodies work. Thank you. That's such a critical idea, right? And so one of the ways that I think we get to imagining new arrangements is when we start with new ideas, right? So if you start with an idea that all bodies work, and then you think about arrangements that would flow from that idea, right? And how different those arrangements would be, right? And what different effects that would create, right? So when we think about all of our bodies working and creating arrangements that work for all of our bodies, right? Then you're thinking differently. You're thinking about an arrangement that works for all of us better or that assumes that we all need to be in the room, right? Whether that's with, with ramps, with better translation, with more time and space to get our thoughts out, depending on how we process things, like that person who might be processing more slowly or getting to the room more slowly has really important knowledge, right? So how does that actually influence our new arrangements? Because they're bringing ideas that are going to make this work better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the ways that we imagine new arrangements, uh, we call productive fictions. So we create micro spaces where the world we want already exists. Um, one of this, one of our examples is what we call the public kitchen. We asked ourselves if kitchens were public like libraries, how might that change social life? And when you say public kitchen, people think soup kitchen. Oh, that's for them. That's for those people. I know some people who should go there. I know some people who do go there, but it's never us. It's never people don't identify as wanting to be a part of a public kitchen. But when we talk about libraries, we don't say I know somebody who is um, book insecure. No, we like libraries are great. I wanna get a new book or I wanna to go to that talk. I wanna bring my kid to that read aloud. What if we had public kitchens? We created this new arrangement and we would hold it you know, temporarily with community organizations, maybe for a weekend, maybe for a week. And we would invite people into imagining. You can see a girl there imagining a new people's permit because we were questioning the arrangements of how food gets permitted. Um, we were cooking collectively, we were uh, cooking in beautiful spaces, we were collectively imagining a public kitchen um, with that kind of scaffolding to get people thinking, oh, you know what, I was pretty cool, but you know, you should totally have my uncle cook there, or could my kid get a job there, or why don't you have a garden, right? Like as we started to imagine it, people could bring their own ideas. Another new arrangement that we imagined was we thought about um, Kenny, my coworker, and I. I'm a basketball player. You know what? There's basketball courts everywhere. There was a basketball court across the street from the old studio. I could go out and play basketball whenever I wanted. Besides the social arrangement of most courts taken up by boys, right? And what it meant for girls to get on the court. Um, Kenny's a dancer. He's like, why can't I have a dance court? How come there can't be some speakers that just pop up? Like, why is it that dancing and playing music is so much more constricted? Why isn't this a normal part of everyday life? So we actually created temporary dance courts where we set up a DJ on the basketball court, right? And we invited people to join and we had kids chalking on the court and we had people dancing on the court and it was temporary, but again, it was a way to help people imagine a new arrangement. Um, Sistafire, the group in Providence I was talking about, they imagined an arrangement of a community altar. And as you can see, this was during COVID. It was also, during the movement for Black Lives, and they were connecting Black and Brown women who had been victims of state-sanctioned violence, whether it was at the hands of the police 
or was at the hands of medical care, right? Because they had been refused care or given care that actually did not help them survive. And so they brought this altar together with artists and with the community, and they created this new arrangement of the community altar. Oops, that disappeared. So I'd love to think about what are some of the ideas embedded in this community altar as a new arrangement. Oops, if anyone wants to add or think. Well, like you were saying, um, to have a space to, like the community kitchen, what brilliant ideas, what a beautiful way to rethink uh, rethink what already exists. You know, we've built, even in the United States, the towns are built around churches, which is like a community altar, which was, which was supposed to be the gathering space. Mm. Um, there was, and you know, commons. Town and commons. commons. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I'm thinking also of old European cities where the oven used to be in the center of the town. Mm. And so everyone could go bake their bread. Um, uh, in a common space mm. and dance and music, um, bringing that into, into life, into mm -hmm. our everyday existence and having- Thinking about music as healing, right? We don't have any music in our waiting rooms. We don't have any music in our hospitals. Um, thinking about movement as healing, thinking about community building as healing, right? Thinking about our public spaces as part of our public health. You know, and the things that we're learning about these public spaces, even at, in the context of climate change, and what does it mean to have green space in your community and how that helps with the temperature escalating in the summer. Um, but public spaces as places of healing, as places where people can come together, people in this case could write on a rock and add it to the, to the altar. You could see people could add flowers to the altar, really thinking even there about the role of artists, right, in that public healing process in the community altar and artists built that altar. Artists were part of the, the flowers and the rocks and the posters and the music. I, I don't know if you've thought a lot about this, um, but my mind is going to, you know, when we're creating shared space, um, I like to think about uh, what everyone's bringing to that space and mm. if it's being um, respected, if it's being respectful of someone else's views and someone else's cultural background or, or understanding um, of community. How does, how do we, how do we, how do you address that when you're planning programs like this? Like, what happens if we do offend each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I think, when I think about our productive fictions, they are works in progress, right? So they're never planned in isolation. They're planned with community members, with artists, but also there's room to say yes, right? So if you're listening to music at a social emergency response center, that was another one of our imagined arrangements, or at a public kitchen, you can say, can I play my music? Or could I, could I bring my food tomorrow? Or, you know, like there's ways that it, the invitation is this might not be your music or your food, but it's somebody else's. We can collectively make music, add music, add food. But I think you're right. There are not always times for that, right? There's times where you have to have a difficult conversation. And what you're trying to create is the, is the context for that to happen in a way that's understanding, you know? And I think about when we started our social emergency response center, it was right after Trump's inauguration. And we were creating a space that said, we're in a social emergency, we're all experiencing it differently, right? This is a place where we need to actually come to terms with the fact that it's impacting all of us, but that it's impacting us differently. We need to be able to listen and hear how it's impacting different people. And creating that space that had healing and cooking and making and plotting gave us room to come at that challenge in different ways. That it wasn't just like, I've, you know, like folks who've been experiencing the social emergency for a long time, kind of bumping into these sort of whites who are like, oh my God, we're in a social emergency. I had no idea. That can be a tough bump, right? Mm -hmm. But as we recognize how it's impacting us differently, as we bring our different skills and knowledge, we're actually able to be in that space in a way that wasn't about, are you woke or not woke? Are you experiencing it in this way or that way? Um, and so when I think about 
um, imagining new arrangements in healthcare, it's getting to that as well, right? It's like, what, what are we each able to bring and how are we integrating different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of healing in a way that feels different than are you broke or not broke? <laughs> Um, are you uh, listening to your doctor or not listening to your doctor? Let's wag a finger at you, right? Are you um, listening to the CDC or not listening? To, but what are we bringing and, and how does that add to our understanding of healthcare? How does that, how does that understand the social determinants of health and the fact that we don't all have equal access to the sorts of spaces and health insurance and, you know, like that kind of thing, right? Like what kinds of knowledge are we bringing that helps us understand what people are going through and what, what they need, uh, what we need. So I wanna just kind of leave off with that so we can spend our last uh, five or so minutes. Um, I'll stop sharing. Uh, I don't know that we actually get to see each other, but I'll stop sharing so that we can do some Q&A. Again, you can add it to the chat. You can add it in the Q&A. Um, you can ask each other questions. You can ask me questions. I really loved how you all have included a lot of healing activities through um, this Black History Month series. We do that as well. Like when we do our online social emergency response center, really mixing it up between conversation and yoga and making and you know various kinds of, of healing and meditation. So it's been a really beautiful program that you all put together. Thank you. I'm kind of like you were thinking, like I think you had mentioned, um, thinking about whole health um, and what's the word uh, all encompassing health like mm -hmm. wraparound health that's the word I was looking for that's mm -hmm. the term I was looking for wraparound health and what that actually looks like I mean you talked about it in terms of bringing the arts in bringing sports in bringing um, music Ooh. in mm -hmm. you know food absolutely yeah. uh, you know a, a basic uh, need um, Oh, we have uh, we have a correction. Thank you so much. Um, it's a it says Eleonora oh, says uh, uh, to to us. She says you mentioned that music is not available at hospitals. I just wanted to let you know that at MGH and in many other places, music therapy and an environmental music is provided. I love that. I love that. I was thinking that music isn't in the uh, weight room and that maybe you've improved on that as well. Um, but anywhere music is provided, right, um, can be really joyful. Thinking about different ways to provide music, thinking about different ways to provide food. Um, so often in our, I think so often in the United States, we default to um, either our massive food systems or our like lowest common denominator, like what wouldn't, what would work for every, you know, like this idea that American food is the most acceptable or the easiest to understand or, you know, like, so there's so many ways that we, well, music might bother somebody or this might bother somebody, but like without any of those things, what are we left with? Um, and, and how do we think, you know, in, in the ways that, that, our, um, that our participant was just saying, like what music brings, what it adds, to, for all of us, you know, not just for our patients, but for all of our healing, for all of our ability to be in an emergency room that's very stressful or on a floor that's very busy. Um, I, I do think that um, in terms of what the speaker was saying or the, um, the guest was saying, Eleonora, um, we, I mean, we do need to think a little bit about when we're providing therapy, it is different. There are lots of constructs around that as well and structures around that when we're providing music. And COVID has actually made it so that we don't have as much environmental music available to us, at least the live pieces of it um, mm -hmm. available mm -hmm. to us in the same way. Um, it was definitely a part of programming pre-COVID. Um, and I'm actually not aware of the environmental music uh, piece, uh, at least in MGH. But you bring up really good points, I mean, about, and my thought keeps going back to the idea of democracy and, okay, we're in a democracy, and so we have to come to this generalized idea, which you just spoke about, of what is the lowest common denominator, um, and how do we get there? Uh, how do we even have the conversation to get there is often 
where we all get stuck, I feel like. One of the uh, one of the arrangements that changed really quickly during COVID was our uh, ability to get healthcare from our homes. You know, like the the Zoom care with my doctor. You know, and and I'm sure it also has its its limits in terms of who can access it or how helpful it is in all situations, right? But it was really a breakthrough for a lot of people who did not want to or who couldn't be seen, right? So that was that was a really interesting breakthrough, both in terms of therapy and even like, I have a tick on my leg, I can show my doctor on Zoom, you know, like some, some things like that. Um, but we have a little more in the chat. The Environmental Music is a volunteer program at NGH run through the Expressive Therapies Department. Very small right now, but working on providing music in hallways and waiting rooms. I love that. That's that awesome. Great. Thank you so much. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for volunteering for it. I think of some of the beautiful things that have been brought forward in our in our children's hospitals, um, and also in um, you know my dad had cancer, and some of the beautiful things that were available to him as he was getting chemo. Right. I wonder if some of these things that we've been able to pilot. Either we think children need it and adults don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's an idea <laughs> Hello. Um, or you know we can do it in these small ways or in these particularly resourced areas of the hospital um, and, and you think about what can we learn in those places and how can we how can we spread it how can we grow it um, so that our adults and elders get it or so that our patients who don't have cancer get it or like what are the things that we've been able to to learn even from COVID right that we might be able to continue with that have benefited from folks who don't want to be seen or don't want to leave the house, even when it's not COVID, you know, like there's, there's some interesting things that we have learned that are new arrangements um, that we might want to borrow from and think about in other contexts as we continue to think about really health justice. I love how your mind works. Um, you, you know, you flipped it to a positive. Absolutely. COVID has brought us all online. In some ways we have access to things that we didn't used to have access to um speeches and conferences and things that we would never be able to attend we can see our doctors see our therapists right online from the comforts of of our home if we can if that if we have access to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and you know maybe and there are ways to build that out as well so i really appreciate the way that your mind works and it <laughs> flips it um it's wonderful to hear that's that's an absolute positive we wouldn't be here otherwise now would we that's true um <laughs> here we are on zoom i right. want to just add uh into the chat the link to ideas arrangements effects because i feel like there's so many ways that you all could take this you know as you think about the arrangements of healthcare within and beyond the hospital uh if you think about the arrangements of healthcare during and post or I don't know if there's a post-COVID, but like what we've learned during this really strange time that might be worth hanging on to, um, what we can learn and borrow as we think about our, our really common spaces in hospitals, right? And those, those really overlapping arrangements. Um, so I'll just drop that into the, uh, I think I kind of do it off the top of my head, but I think this will do it. Um, Maybe you can test that for me, Dia, as we yep. get close to one o'clock. And I know one thing about, you know, health settings is like teacher settings, man. When you hit a deadline, they're like, poof, hey, the kids are coming, like, poof, lunch is over and people just evaporate. So um, just we're, want we're... to acknowledge that we are closing in on time. Um, but I think that, you know, it's been really a pleasure since the book came out. I've worked with particularly health resources in action, thinking about public health um, within and beyond our our medical systems, but also thinking with community health providers in all different ways um, and thinking about some of the arrangements of health and something really thinking more deeply about the ideas, our ideas about health and how they get embedded in arrangements and which ones we might want to interrupt. So I would love to continue thinking with you all as you think about imagining new arrangements um, that are more just, imagining um, new arrangements that are more joyful within our existing arrangements. Um, and intervening in, a risk, in existing arrangements, right? We didn't get to that a lot, but there's a lot of arrangements that you all are thinking about. How do we intervene in really critical arrangements that would make our patients get better care, make our patients able to access something, whether it's language or 
you know, some of the alternative kinds of care. So I really love the work that y'all are doing. And I'm so grateful um, that you had me. Feel free to reach out if there's anything else um, I can add, but uh, really love your work. And I thank everyone for joining us. Love your work as well. And thank you for helping us think about things um, differently and infusing these these little ideas of health um, and how we start to think about it differently um, as well. Uh, um, you come up with very innovative ideas in design, in designing these spaces, and that's been helpful for us to learn about and see today. And I'm so grateful for you for joining us um, and sharing that as well. Oh, my pleasure, absolutely. Um, let's just stay in touch and thank you everyone for coming. Um, absolutely. And happy Black History Month. And that link does work. So um, please feel free to find more of Lori's work and the team's work um, at diasporasi.org. Thank you, Lori. Look forward to working more. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.